I'd like to call to order the work session on April 2nd, 2018. It's now 5 o'clock. We are all here but Wally, and I think that she had an appointment, so she's going to try to get here for the next meeting. So we're going to go on, okay? So there's no items for discussion here, so we're going to go to 3.1. Staff will present information on the Smart City Components, Initiatives, and Strategies. Our Chief Information Officer, Alan Claypool, is presenting, and he has several guests with him that will be introduced. Clay, you've got the floor. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Today we're going to provide you with an overview of what being a smart city can mean so the Council can provide a policy direction on which areas you'd like staff to bring forth. I have some very distinguished guests who have joined me up here to present some material to you and then answer any of your questions. I have Lev, who is the CIO of ASU, new CIO for ASU, Brianne with GPEC, Darren from GPEC also, and Dominic from AZIDP. Good evening. Thanks for uh, having me here. My name is Lev Gonick. I am the Chief Information Officer at Arizona State University. I'm happy to share with you some work underway at ASU and to provide you some context for uh, this evening's conversation. Uh, let me begin just by sharing with you uh, some developments at a global uh, level with respect to Internet usage, uh, which we oftentimes think of as a kind of U.S. Uh, special sauce. Uh, if you take a look at the data here, you'll briefly see that um, while we have a lot of penetration of Internet, mostly at 95 percent, all the growth in the world is actually happening around us, uh, which has led to uh, the need to innovate, uh, because when we say 95 percent penetration, that means 95 percent of us human beings are talking to each other using the Internet. And what I'm about to share with you is now a new development in the age of Internet, which is to say specifically machines talking to each other. So here is a kind of look at the so-called Internet of Things, machines talking to each other. That's what Internet of Things is. The first uh, piece uh, here really speaks to simply the size of the uh, market uh, with respect to the number of, of units. Uh, and then the second uh, piece to the right is actually the, the market size, growing basically to a half a trillion dollars and 75 billion devices, things in your cars, uh, in your refrigerators, in your homes, uh, and here in the um, in chambers, uh, and as I'll share with you, in sporting facilities as well. Uh, why is it happening? Uh, why now? Why is it so interesting? Uh, largely because there are significant shifts uh, in the price uh, of the the stuff that makes it possible for sensors to, to start talking to each other. Um, and this uh, slide simply shows that the cost per unit. Uh, for stuff that what we thought was almost impossible to imagine, like DNA sequencing, uh, only t 20 years ago, less than 20 years ago, uh, has just rapidly dropped to almost zero, zero for the cost of doing that sequencing, and the cost for sensors is likewise depleted. And again, all kinds of implications uh, when that begins to happen. Again, we live it every day in our consumer experience. Uh, likewise, we're seeing, again, this explosion of the Internet of Things, oftentimes called the Industrial Internet, it's a $15 trillion growth in the economy, and it behooves cities uh, all over the world to be thinking about how do we take advantage of this new economy. If we were not first in the first generation of the Internet back in the 90s, what can we do in this next generation to make a difference in the lives of our constituents and in the cities for purposes of economic attraction uh, and the like? And so, again, there are just a series of important uh, in, uh, developments going on in the transportation uh, sector. Obviously, we know those well here in Arizona with respect to autonomous uh, vehicles, but there's a whole lot more uh, to it with respect to um, all the technology that's being attracted all over the valley with respect to this particular industry that has essentially gone from zero uh, to uh, its way to being a trillion-dollar business. Um, obviously, also important here is work not only a around uh, the use of uh, Technologies uh, like traffic control, but now a whole new industry, which is um, how do we get air traffic control for drones? We have drones. Now how do we get air traffic control for the drones along the way? New opportunities here. Uh, again, multi-billion dollar business that went from zero to billions uh, literally in three years. Uh, and, of course, it also impacts uh, our lives, uh, both for high-tech uh, health care, wearable technologies that feel like skin, 
and new bandages uh, that have uh, capabilities of directly delivering uh, to um, targeted uh, areas uh, for us, so body chemistry. All of this is the internet of things uh, along the way. So I want to just briefly show you a video of how we're making use of it at ASU. We set out to find how do we change the conversation around what isn't possible to the art of the possible. My name is Chris Richardson. I'm the Assistant Vice President of IT Development for Arizona State University. We've been ranked number one innovation ahead of schools like Stanford and MIT now two years in a row. And it means that we're embedding innovation into our schools, into our departments, into basically everything we do. The stadium was initially built in 1958 because of the technical infrastructure being so outdated. Sending a text on game day was difficult. We needed to enhance the game day experience for our fans. From our standpoint, it's from the time they wake up on game day. So it's when they're getting ready to leave their house, figuring out the best way to find a parking spot. Once they've parked their car, what's the fastest route into the stadium for them so they can find their seat fast. And then once the game begins, you know, figuring out different ways to engage with the fans, as well as offering them tips, for which concessions have the shortest lines, and same thing with restrooms. So it's really helping ease a lot of those pain points that we hear about from an operational standpoint and improving on those. We started with 44 sensors in our south end zone that connected at five different parameters. Temperature, sound, humidity, vibration, altitude, and then um, we also did some network stuff from the BLE Bluetooth Low Energy. We were able to then connect information ways that we hadn't before at scale, and then turn that into an interactive endeavor. Imagine that when the fans arrive, we give them all different hats with smart technology inside. Arizona State goes up 7-0. We decide to alternate a coloration between maroon and gold, just one simple push, and we could have the entire stadium enabled like that. Our goal now is to bring out to life whatever it is that we know fans want and deliver it directly to them in their seats in multiple ways. We're bringing together not only athletics folks with our technical folks, but our facilities people, our parking people, those that run all the energy efficiency because we're trying to showcase what is possible with access to the data. That continued collaboration and idea sharing will help us create one of the best game day experiences in college football. So I thought to use a sports example because I figured that we're here in Goodyear. Uh, being from Cleveland, um, I've managed to find my way out here more than once uh, for spring training. I just want to uh, briefly uh, finish with a couple of sort of slides to highlight what you saw in the video. And uh, so there, we, there we go there. So uh, again, uh, this is kind of the infrastructure of what it takes to actually build out an Internet of Things solutions for uh, a game day experience. And of course, it's part of a core economic development strategy for uh, us in Tempe. Uh, it, it means in, including a lot of uh, infrastructure uh, that uh, we can uh, support, again, all of these sensors that I referred to earlier, supporting real-time uh, parking, uh, supporting new mobile apps, uh, and creating, again, solutions that simply don't exist or have not existed today. So a chance to create, be part of a, a new uh, part of the industry. Um, again, uh, a lot of uh, work inside our suites, so again, creating a really exciting experience for uh, the high-end uh, in, uh, investors uh, in uh, ASU sports, um, doing all kinds of uh, um, opportunities to visualize the, the developments that are going on around the campus from, uh, crowd, uh, from crowd to uh, ambient noise uh, to uh, even being able to do image analysis uh, and the like. Uh, we have dashboards now in the suites uh, uh, on the west side, uh, and uh, now with the east side uh, stadium uh, facilities coming up, we'll have these in the suites as well. Uh, that provides a real-time information uh, that is uh, of interest uh, to, again, visitors as well as uh, to facilities management. Uh, we're using voice-enabled services uh, through a partnership with Amazon. Amazon came to us because they were interested in what was going 
who was using this technology that most of us use to say set the alarm clock, right? How can you actually use this kind of technology to create uh, a unique experience that can then create a new industry uh, for others to build on? Uh, and again, just finally then, uh, again, now trying to move this across the campus. In other words, my suggestion here for your consideration is to think about a small project. It could be a stadium-like project, and then think how it could then grow to inform uh, the whole uh, Goodyear uh, community uh, over time. Uh, we're working on smart fleets, which again, we thought would be interesting here, learning uh, classroom technologies, uh, smart assistance uh, through voice-enabled services uh, and the like. I left you 30 seconds. Uh, for that one. <laughs> Absolutely. Let me pass, pass this to Breen. I'm Darren Jones. Oh, sorry. Okay. I just want to make sure who was going to go next. Oh, yeah. Darren Jones from GPAC. I apologize for my voice. I'm getting over a nasty cold. I'm beyond the incubation period, though, so I'm not contagious, I believe. <laughs> um, here we go. So, GPAC, many of you are familiar with. Uh, GPEC and, and our core mandate, which is uh, kind of three-pronged here, business attraction, marketing, and communications, and competitiveness. High-level metrics for GPEC here, 27 locates year-to-date, uh, supporting over 5,000 jobs that will generate over $600 million in capital investment. A lot of amazing projects here in good years, some of which I've worked on myself and had the pleasure of presenting to you a few times on uh, projects like Chewy um, that I recently located here a few months ago. On the marketing and communication side, this is really what anchors our business attraction work, in addition to the research that I'll get into with competitiveness. Um, we connect the placement we go into on a, the subsequent, subsequent slides, um, but in competitive, competitiveness as well um, on slide on a modern economy plan and our competitiveness policy is there. Um, again, I mentioned some of the high-level prospects that you know, I've worked on personally here in Goodyear. Um, 82 office prospects in our pipeline. Pipeline remains very strong. Industrial is really driving our market. Uh, we see that regionally. Um, so in terms of institutional investment, uh, speculative investment, a lot of that happening here with PV303. Some great work here. Um, just had a client in last week um, looking in this area. Of... Want to share that? <laughs> they, I think my mic went off right when I said that, and it wasn't planned. Um, so connected place is really what the meat of what I want to talk about. Um, this emerged from our um, global investment plan about two or three years ago. And what we found from the confluence of legacy companies in aerospace and defense sector and the emerging industries uh, throughout the region, there was a nexus here between the technologies that microprocessing, semiconductors, that are being used in a lot of the IoT devices that Lev mentioned. Um, so these companies are really leveraging kind of the new emerging technology stacks, but really building upon that enterprise DNA that's developed here organically over the last 50 years. So we've dubbed that the connected place. And that's our um, national and, and international brand proposition to change the, um, the perception of Phoenix from a place where it's just sunny all the time, it's a lot of golf and a great quality of life to a place where technology is thriving organically. A lot of other regions will say that they're a technology hub and that's an aspirational. Um, endeavor. What we found here is that this is really have grown has grown organically over the last uh, 50 years, um, and particularly with IoT in the last, I'd say, 15 to 20 here in the region. So again, this is something that we're um, out being champions of in the market, saying this is happening here. We have a great cluster of companies across four verticals: uh, sensor technology, um, cybersecurity, and automated manufacturing, industry 4.0, and uh, automated driving autonomous vehicles. And that's important when you think about what we're doing with the smart region, which is what I'll get into a little bit. So when you think about all the technology that's being developed in the region, what's really enabling that growth? It's really the cities that have come together and said, we're going to support technologies, be business friendly. Um, we have the requisite infrastructure to support the development of these uh, companies and help them go to scale. Um, we're going to cooperate with them in terms of operating in our cities. And what we found in terms of driving the modern economy is when you think of a smart region, um, or smart cities even, it's usually a patchwork of different cities trying different things. How do you standardize that across the region to deliver, um, to generate those economies of scale? So a lot of the IoT devices that Lev talked about, um, you think about the Roomba, for example. Um, there's a company here called Insight that really has an underlying technology that allows the Roombas to talk to each other. Um, that's, how, that's being developed in Phoenix. So the connectivity, the interoperability, those things can be enabled at the city level because um, that's the infrastructure that's going to drive this growth. 
Um, and Dom is going to talk about that in a little bit. The modern economy plan, um, that is really on our, again, regional competitiveness. So that's, again, uh, the research, the smart region, the workforce development, the infrastructure development policy. And infrastructures, it, it's roads, it's, it's, it's your um, utilities, but it's also your telecom, your fiber connectivity. We consider that infrastructure as well. And that's a huge enabling uh, factor for uh, IoT and, and, and the connected devices that we're looking to uh, support and, and expand in the region. So getting to our smart region vision here, um, using technology to solve challenges. So a lot of these technologies are being generated on enterprise level. So again, Lev did a great job talking about the IoT devices and DNA sequencing and, and um, some of the enterprise tech uses, but how does that translate to solving public policy challenges, public policy problems or, opportun or generating opportunities in our region? So how can we leverage that technology being developed in the enterprise level? to solve issues or challenges around water and air and traffic management and intentional planning uh, in your CIPs and where that would l lend itself to um, smart technology adoption and leverage in, in, those, um, in those projects. I'm gonna go back to the slide a little bit and part of the framework again is, is to, um, I'm not gonna go too deep into this, but you think about procurement, you think about cost savings, you think about um, data sharing and interoperability. So if you're doing a project in traffic management, maybe surprise or Avondale has a similar idea and you can share data and share, um, you, know, you can procure similar services and reduce your costs that way. And this is again, anecdotal, but this is kind of where we're thinking this could be useful. Uh, benefits of collaboration, again, I highlighted some of these, um, economies of scale in a connected region. When you think about when trying to attract companies and business to the region, if you have that uh, regional framework and connectivity, that's gonna be a, a stronger value proposition to say you can plug into a uh, robust infrastructure that's shared across the region. You can have four or five, six cities that wanna modernize their um, LED sensors or their lights and, you have, and you're a sensor company. We can connect you with those, those opportunities here and um, help you evaluate those companies as well and say, does it make sense to deploy those technologies in our community? Um, so it works both ways, a very symbiotic relationship between the public and private sector that will be driven by the smart region strategy. And again, it reinforces the connected place identity. So now we have the organic companies that are driving IoT and um, disruptive technology in the, those four verticals I mentioned. And then how do we, again, deploy that to solve public sector challenges and really truly have a connected place? And that gets back to the infrastructure um, notion as well. When you think about wireless connectivity and communications infrastructure and telecom and, and roadways that support autonomous vehicles, that, that will help drive those, the growth of those companies and that will be driven by investments made in the different cities. So smart region framework, again, um, Dominic's really the, the muscle, a lot of the muscle behind a lot of this, literally, literally and figuratively if you look at them. Um, and so standards for coordinated program for management processes, identify and prioritize needs. So again, a lot of this conversation we're having now is exactly the type of conversations you want to have in the future. It's how do you assess your needs? How do you assess where technology fits in? How do you, how do you identify where the value add is? How do you do an appraisal of the costs and, and the benefit and ROI of that? Um, how do you know when the technology should be refreshed or how you should uh, manage your investments in terms of long-term um, sustainability for technology? So partnering with our industry partners, we're not leading that conversation. It's really connecting you with the folks that do have that expertise um, and helping drive that conversation and, and ask the right questions and get to the right result. Again, sharing best practices, again, data management, interoperability, that's huge for that, um, and implementing solutions. We like to call them opportunity sets. So again, when you think about what makes sense for Goodyear, maybe you identify 10 to 15 opportunities or, or challenges you'd like to solve with technology. Um, are those standardized across other communities as well? And where can you share resources to solve those problems or deploy those solutions uh, regionally? And that I'm gonna turn over to Dominic with IDP. There we go. My name is Dominic Pop. I'm the executive director for the Institute for Digital Progress, or IDP for short. And I'm Italian, and I love to talk, so I wrote a script here to make sure I keep me on track and uh, be respectful of your time. So um, IDP is a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and our entire mission is to help transform our region and our cities into global leaders in smart city and IoT technology driven by collaborative civic innovation. Uh, as a former city employee myself, I founded IDP for one main reason. Due to budget constraints and the increasing pressure to deliver more and better services, 
our city did not have the resources to hire a chief innovation officer or to build a standalone innovation department that many of the world-renowned cities have and use to drive smart city innovation within their communities. IDP acts as the external innovation department for cities in an independent community organization that can help drive technology and innovation for your city. We do this not through words or white papers, but through action. We built IDP to be a city's do tank uh, to help launch the practical application of technology within your community that can create a real impact for real people. Uh, we help cities in the region enter the smart arena and accelerate their development into a smart city through our smart city as a service model. Smart city initiatives of the recent past have relied heavily on big hardware deployments enabled by sizable CapEx investments. As I mentioned, many communities, especially smaller communities, find themselves insufficiently equipped to deal with such endeavors. Nowadays, ever more smart city services can be provided as, as a service. For example, smart parking and smart lighting can now be brought to the city as a service, while insights through data analytics on top of such services can be brought as an intelligent service as well. This smart city as a service vastly enhances the city's ability to plan, procure, deploy, and leverage smart city solutions seamlessly and securely without the CapEx investment extravaganzas of the past. Through a public-private nonprofit partnership between IDP, ASU, and industry partners, we plan to help transform our region into a smart region by providing cities like Goodyear with smart city as a service options. I wanted to quickly highlight uh, two opportunities that we could help bring to Goodyear. Cities, cities around the world are harnessing the power of data to drive economic development and improve city services. In order to accelerate the development of next generation IoT applications and solutions, we are working with cities to help them launch innovation sandboxes. These sandboxes would start as open and public test environments for beacons and sensors. Through the P3, we would deploy a network of beacons and IoT sensors that would collect data in real time, aggregate it, and push it out to the public to build solutions and applications with. Data that can be collected can range from counting foot traffic um, to pollution levels, to number of open parking spaces, to noise levels within, within your city. To, uh, this data would also be available to the city to help make better, more informed decisions. For example, the sensors could read traffic congestion and help determine the best way to time signals at different times of day. This data will also be available to ASU researchers who can help study more long-term effects such as congestion's impact on public health. And so our, our ideal vision is when connected across the region, these sandboxes will become a transformative, a region-wide transformative platform for cities, entrepreneurs, uh, developers, industry, and academia to use our cities as R&D and commercialization testing grounds. The latest, the last opportunity that I wanted to discuss with you is the Smart City Academy. Technology is advancing at an unbelievable rate, and it's hard to keep up with the knowledge and expertise needed to understand how these technologies could impact our cities, how blockchain can help permitting processes, or why cities are looking to leverage AI in city inspections. The Smart City Academy is a digital workforce development initiative specifically targeted at city employees in the region to help train them on how they can advance the digital future of their cities. Through a series of master classes led by international experts, the Smart City Academy will develop the knowledge and expertise of your city employees and prepare them to face the digital revolution that is now upon us. Uh, so I appreciate your time here today and uh, look forward to your questions. Thank you. It's over to you. It's over to me. And I still have two minutes and 30 seconds left. All right. So she's bringing up my presentation. Did you have? Um, they got presented already. Oh, okay. All right. So the first question you're probably going to ask us is what are the other cities doing? And this is just a very small subset of what the other cities are looking at topic wise is the focus of this slide. You know Tempe is big into the uh, autonomous vehicles and so forth. We've seen that. Lev talked about that. Transit ride sharing is growing uh, leaps and bounds in a lot of the cities. They're also looking at smarter buildings. A lot of the folks are looking at not just LEED certification, but beyond that. They're looking at the materials. They're looking at the skin. They're looking at all sorts of different parts for smarter buildings. And then, of course, one of the easy things is traffic infrastructure. 
looking at how you can improve traffic, and I think someone talked about improving parking. Do I know, especially during the Christmas season, where there are parking spots at the different uh, complexes? Citizen engagement has been going on for multiple years when we started out with Twitter and the websites and so forth, but now people are starting to take that to the next level. So what about Goodyear? What should we think about? Again, at the high level topic area, we put together some tidbits for you just to spark your imagination. Of course, citizen engagement is always important to us here in Goodyear. Making sites shovel ready with broadband. So we already put a lot of infrastructure into the ground. What about also, which we do do some of that already, but putting that into more codification into the ordinances and so forth. Smart traffic signal ma management, of course, again, we've, we're on the beginning of that. We have some of that. Do we want to expand that? And then sensors around the park amenities so that the parents, when they're at the ball games watching their children, they can do other things. And we talked a little bit about the beacons and the sensors to gather information. How crowded is that park? How many people are in the park? If you look at uh, Google Live, if you haven't already done that, it can be both fascinating and scary at the same time. They can tell how many people are in a given store at a time. How do they do that? Well, they don't have sensors at each of the stores. How they're actually doing is tracking your cell phone. That's the scary and the, the benefit part. They know where you are in your cell phone, by they're tracking it by geolocation if you have any Google apps on your phone. So they can count how many people are in a certain area, assume you're at that store, and you'll see the bar if you go to it, and it'll say the store is now very crowded or the store is not very crowded. It's not just historical. It's live. We can have ordinances that are friendly to the technology R&D, and I think these folks can help us with that. And smart irrigation. What can we do about irrigation? The starting point would be timers, but what can we do beyond that? So now it comes down to your questions. Grill these folks hard. Ask them any hard questions you'd like. First of all, thank you for those great presentations. And uh, GPEC has certainly uh, been uh, informing the mayors when we meet in the meetings. And so some of this is news. Most of it is not from that. Um, so let's start. Who would like to be first? Questions? Bill? I'm not sure who to direct it to, so I'll just throw it to the group and let you guys decide. In the, the concept of um, regionalization of this whole smart city idea, there seems to be a role for MAG in this, the Maricopa Association of Governments, and why I don't know where we are with that, so I'm not, I'm not even sure where to direct this question, but it does us a little good here to ramp up smartly when you can't get from downtown Phoenix through Tolleson and Avondale before you get to here, and then there's nothing from here beyond. I mean, it, I, I like the idea of this being a collaborative build, a, build upon, you know, let's, uh, much like the regional wireless radio cooperative that required the impact of everybody and that was very regional so i'd like to he hear someone talk a little bit about that and about what the role of mag and if anyone here particularly the mayor if you know if mag is even looking at this from a regional perspective so i can answer that um we've been talking to we've been talking to mag about this um our vision for the smart region is to bring in partners depending on what areas the cities want to prioritize. MAG makes a lot of sense if we're trying to solve something in transportation. Mm -hmm. They might not make as much sense if we're trying to sol solve something about water. And so we want to make sure that we're bringing in partners who have expertise in the right areas and letting where we want to focus define who we bring to the table. So they are aware and we are continuing to talk with them as we gather more information from the cities about what the focus is going to be. I know MAG... Oh, if I can just, MAG has looked beyond just transportation, though. They've started to look at economic development. They're starting to look at a number of other things. So I'm hopeful that we're uh, I, I can just interject right now. Um, from the mayor's From the mayor's yeah. initiatives, they're more interested in them sticking to where they are 
they do, they, there are certain subjects we certainly like the economic development. But that economic development is more information. It doesn't even come close to GPAC. Right. And uh, the conversation has been be behind uh, MAC and, uh, and GPAC. The consensus is among the cities that GPAC does something very, very well. And why would you try to bring another entity in on this? And, and, but they're all, they're all talking. So it's not a matter of, I don't know what you're doing and what are you doing this for? And so I, that okay. is not a worry for us at all. I have to say, I can probably say that honestly but from the mayor's conversation, um, that we respect each of the uh, areas that are being developed. I think where the difficulty might be in is to, for us to assess how this partnership works and how we can take advantage of the advanced technology in the neighboring city and tag on to that. So, so. Uh, it's a good question, um, but it's been asked over and over again. Okay. Okay. Great. Thanks. And Lev, I caught you. I cut you off. So please. I was only going to sh share that. Yeah, you had. I don't know, being new to the community, um, all of the various organizations. I will share with you. I've been in this space, smart cities and IoT, for now going on 18 years. Uh, this there's something very special going on in the valley. Uh, this idea of regional collaboration at scale. The only part in the place in the world that I, well, two places in the world where I've been involved is in, in Europe and in, and in Asia, where they've also been working at regional scale. This project, the 22 cities plus the counties and so forth, uh, it's the only way at this moment in time to create a differentiated offering to do that attraction of all of the, again, trillion dollar businesses that are to come. Um, if we were to try to do it one city at a time, we would never win. That, that's kind of where I was going. I, I appreciate that. Um, so just a couple of final comments. The things that many of you have talked about that are very interesting to me, and this will be a shock, the smart traffic idea that we can start to leverage the ability to actually activate the traffic lights sequentially um, is very interesting. I love the idea of the sandbox. Uh, concept and us being uh, being able to to look at it, utilizing that. I wonder if the current fiber optic technology that we're using to interconnect our traffic lights doesn't help assist in that. And and I don't know what the bandwidth is. I'm, you're I'm reaching my limit of technology expertise, but I just throw that out there. I think that's awesome. And then. Um, the R&D ordinances, I think, leads to a question that I'm going to have maybe later tonight um, about looking at not just R&D ordinances, but maybe looking at all of them in general. But uh, those are the three things that, from the, the conversation, that I got really, uh, you know, the hair on the back of my neck stood up. So thank you for that. Thanks for the presentation. Sherry? Um, yeah, great presentation. Thank you all very much. I, I get very excited when I hear about this. When we heard Bill Gates was going to build a smart city west of us, um, we started talking as a council and said, hey, you know, we thought this might be a time with all the technology going on, how can we bring it to Goodyear? Um, I loved all the ideas. Bill already covered one of my questions about the, the regionalism, how we can best ex exploit that and bring the other cities with us. We are building several new buildings, um, two fire stations and a rec center and a new park or two new parks in the, in the next several years. So one thing, like you were talking about with the stadium, one thing I would like to explore is how can we make sure that those buildings are tech ready? You know, I've seen, um, you know, everything from charging stations for your cell phone at parks and just little things like that and, and all the apps. We also have a stadium that's nearing 10 years, its 10th year anniversary. That might be a good place, like you said, maybe start with one project and see how that is. So I would love to hear more about how we can, what we can do with city buildings to make them smart buildings and make them, you know, for the future. Don't build from what's behind, but build what's ahead. Yeah, I'll just talk from my experience. I've seen that cities now with the smart the smart city movement take off are now 
pro proactively anytime something's about to hit the street, a procurement, an RFP, that they're incorporating smart technology within their procurements um, from the very beginning. So that way it's not an afterthought, it's initial thought, because there's a lot of opportunities for public-private partnerships as well through smart technology. And so um, establishing the mechanism to ensure that you know smart technology is a part of your procurement process is one step that I've seen cities take um, at least in the you know process side of things. And if I could just underscore, I see it in two conversations happening at the same time. One is great ideas. Mm -hmm. yeah, this guy's got amazing ideas for kind of how to be thinking about creating those creative fire stations and you've done stuff in public art spaces and I mean, just all kinds. That's one side of the equation. At the same time, yeah, Dominic mentioned the Smart City Academy, which I want to, again, commend for your consideration. Because when procurement needs to think about how to embed all of the technical details, as, as well as the regulatory details, to enable you to be ready, that actually takes a certain kind of exposure and expertise. It's like going back to school. And you want your city planners and your procurement offices to actually not have to be borrowing some vendor who's trying to sell you something yeah. to write your RFPs along the way. So I think the Smart City Academy program that uh, is, is coming our way is another way to make sure that you're, you're building it into the DNA of the city to be able to take its own destiny into its own hands by actually having expertise developed from within. In understanding it. Joe? You know, I, again, I want to thank you for the presentation and just to piggyback for both Bill and, and Sherry. Um, I also agree with the points they brought up, but I, I think the traffic management system, we hear about that a lot throughout the city. And what I mean by traffic management, about this light not working or that light not working. And, and again, just thinking globally here, if there was a way that we could control that throughout the city and reroute big events, this is where you kind of go in, uh, if you're heading this direction, that direction. From a traffic management standpoint, I think currently would be would be very helpful. Also, broadband. Just a general question. Well, first of all, I like the smart city program as an adjunct professor. You want to make sure you understand enough to be dangerous, I guess. Enough about the subject matter so that when you're going out and exploring particular uh, RFPs, RFQs, whatever the case may be, that you have a general idea that they're on the up and up what they're talking to you about. So I think schooling is always number one to make sure you have enough, especially in technology is moving at the speed this is moving at. But uh, broadband, it's one thing I think we really need to try to get in, into the city. I'm not sure how, but uh, the question I have for you is the technology such right now that uh, wireless units spread out throughout a city or a unit can communicate itself efficient enough uh, as opposed to underground. Are we there yet? You'll never be able to communicate at the same speed, fidelity, and low latency with wireless that you mm -hmm. can always have with what we call glass, which is fiber optics. Okay. You'll always, though, want to have wireless a layer on top of a very robust fiber optic plant. And, again, when you look to the smart cities around the world, it's actually... Uh, while there's a lot of glossy selling that goes on, it's actually pretty straightforward. Fiber optics to as dense or as deep into the city as you can, including all the way up to the residential experience, mm -hmm. but certainly in your commercial areas and in your uh, areas like uh, community parks and, and, and ballparks and things like that. And then as much wireless as you can to get you to the and last mile or two, as you saw in the little video, the right. experience of the fan and so forth. Yeah, I think that's where we're probably lacking a lot throughout the city is is that why is that broadband or that that cable or whatever you want to call it. Glass is it now? Glass. Glass. Okay. Yeah. Sand turned into glass. <laughs> okay. We should have a lot of that around. <laughs> Joanne, thank you, and uh, again, thank you all for being here. You know, uh, listening to all the presentations, you. I'm writing down different things that it, you know, comes to mind as it, <laughs> as we look at our city, we look at our future. Right. Am I on? I'm sorry. And um, identifying a project, I think, is is key. I think that's something that you take little bites at this and and how that works. Um, 
to Sherry's point, you know, with, with new buildings, what does that look like for, for um, our buildings in our city? What does that cost? What, you know, how does that affect us? Um, and, and visualizing all of this, I, I just built my own building, and I think about as, as we have um, any building within our, our city, any codes, anything like that, that we've all taken on as a city, and you look at your blueprints, and every blueprint, different page has a different, you know, um, structure to it, whether you're talking about electricity, whether you're talking about, you know, um, exit ways, whether you're talking, you know, I'm sitting there visualizing a page that is the um, kind of the, the smart framework, you know, that lays upon all of the other pages of what you're, you're doing. And so once you put that together and then you say, okay, how does this all work in a smart fashion? You know, um, to to Joe, what are the redundancies we have here? Um, do we ha and and being sustainable within a city? You know, we don't want to base everything on Wi-Fi. We also have to have the underground infrastructure. So if one goes down, the other one's available. You know, those kinds of things that we look at. Um, we certainly know we all have had the the battle with traffic, and with the f and and if I recall, traffic singles, And if I recall, some of the problem was they can't talk to each other because the fiber is not there for them to talk to each other. So, you know, that's back to to what do we do um, as a council? You know, what's kind of unique about and what you said in Arizona, coming together regionally, it's almost like we have this. How many how many states have the largest county <laughs> within their state? You know, Maricopa County almost gives you know kind of this um, framework in itself of being able to try to talk to each other in that way. I don't I don't know a lot about the sensors and what I would call data harvesting. Um, some of that bothers me. Some of that's Big Brother, and that bothers me. So I'm you know I'm a little. You're not alone in that. I, in I know. Public. I'm, I'm a little, I'm a little yeah. fuzzy on that. Huh? Turn it off. True. Well, what's funny, though, is this weekend we went to our cabin, and we have been in the dead zone all this time, and Verizon put in a cell tower, and all of a sudden my kids are back on their phone, and I'm like, no! <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, so sometimes you want to turn it off. <laughs> and it was like, no! God! So, you know, it's, um, I really appreciate all this. I think that it's important. Um, I think we do have to keep up with it. And, and as we look as a city at our codes, as we look at, and, and I do have a question, you know, when we talk about smart buildings and this and that, what is, what's not in our codes or our ordinances um, that doesn't mean it's a smart building. I mean, we talk about lead, but what is the definition of it being a smart building or a smart project versus it's green? You know, because that's more about efficiency and energy. So I don't know some of those, um, but all in all, it's it's exciting, and we're we're definitely one of the cities in the nation. The fact that we're only 11% built out that really has this is the time to have these conversations thanks Gary you already got me oh you got you I'm sorry Brandon I just didn't want to call you see that I'm sorry <laughs> uh, <laughs> so yeah so I'm gonna repeat some things people asked but so yeah so I like working as a region I was curious how fast or how quick the region's gonna come together to move forward because I I'd, I'd like this good year to definitely be the seat of the table to hopefully push it forward I think we're such a young city, I think now, like she said, now is the time to, for us to want to, and if we can invest little by little over the time period of the next 20, 30, 40 years, that, that, that the next 10 councils ahead of us, like, wow, we really were able to think ahead of time and we were able to lay the groundwork to make sure that we had something really great and special with the city of Goodyear, and I, I want to I wanna make sure we can set that up, so whatever that looks like for us, so, and I really like the Innovation Sandbox, I don't know if that's a a regional per region, but I'd say we, I think could you be more than willing to hope we could be the innovation sandbox for the region, south of the West Valley region. I think we'd be open to that. And then, yeah, I think, yeah, the smart city academies would be good too. I think the more we know, the more, the more of an impact we could have on our city as well. So that's good. And then um, I'm going to be curious, maybe this is for staff, but where we are now compared to the other cities around us. So if we're going to be start looking at building, what do we, what do we have to work with? 
currently, what's the delta compared to our neighbors, so we can at least get up to the region standard and then start moving forward to whatever that, whatever the new the new normal is going to going to be in the future. So, and then um, and then also we talked about it extensively, but integrating new builds in the public private partnerships and taking the time either with code changes or things like that to make sure that we're set up for success or we're not constricting uh, the uh, constricting what we really want to come out of the, the flexibility in our in our future so and then yeah and then anything we can do now the I want to work as a region but I also want to make sure that if we have the opportunity to differentiate ourselves from anybody anybody else I think that'd be that'd be great for us just to Either, either we're leading the way, or the leader, and everybody's the fast followers, or we can differentiate ourselves with, I mean, with water or other things that we're, as a city, we're definitely struggle with, that we will continue to struggle with and have to keep getting better with. So, those are some of the, the big picture things I was looking at. I mean, all of it, all of it is good, and which ones that we, we, we grab onto is probably unique for, for, for us versus maybe a, a different city. But I think as a region, we all want to move together. And we all want to help each other out. So that's that's kind of where I'm at. Yeah, I think the innovation with Sam Mox would be great. So, yeah. so thank you. Thank you again for all your time. Well, for me, this is a big relief because I have been coming back from GPEC and some of the meetings as a mayor uh, that I get invited to, and people have approached me with their cards. You need to be a smart city. Uh, and so each time I would come back and talk to the city manager about it and say, you know, I really need to find out what this smart city is. You sort of have an idea what smart city means, but really the overall picture of how we begin, what's the best way to begin, and then how do we set those fingers out in the state, in our city, to, to hook up or do the right thing in each of the departments and, and for the infrastructure, uh, and for our citizens too. So. I really think, in my view, we definitely need to be more educated on this. We're talking very lightly tonight, so we, I can say this council probably is not ready uh, to make great decisions and voted on it at the dais until we do have somewhat of an academy education of itself. We need that. And then, of course, staff definitely needs it, and we need to find that person that is on staff, or do we need another person? Uh, that would control because you don't want to make mistakes in this one because this is costly um, and we don't want to jump ahead at something that we can't get to step 10 because we didn't do it correctly um, or we don't want any failure. Thank you Wally. I know you had a tough time getting here. appreciate you being here. Um, so I, I just want to make sure we're very organized and strategic in this and that we are fully aware of the cost as we go because there's some things we may be eliminating because that will replace it. And so when we talk about a budget, there may be rooms for moving things. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Our citizens have been calling for more broadband all along. I mean, we are one of the fastest growing cities and what we're finding is we're one of the high income. So people moving here are, and especially in the retirement community, are coming from fairly good revenue in the retirement. And their expectations are up here. We have a lot of Chicago, a lot of Minnesota, we have some New Yorkers, and a lot of California. So you can see that it generates those needs and questions. So uh, I think this is exciting, and I'm anxious to learn more and understand it. So thank you very much each of you all the presentations were very very nice we definitely respect all of these entities of course you know asu and gpec and my first really experience with with um, dominic but uh, we're looking forward to more so thank you so much thank you. Oh, and thank you mr claypool that was great thank you i'm going to give you a round of applause So you're still sitting there. So would you like? Do you have something more to to say on this on this part? Am I, no, I just something? wanted to thank our guests. They okay. drove all the way out here, uh, worked on their presentations for the last month to come out here and share their thoughts with you. As the mayor said, it is the start of a journey. 
And we really have to, I don't like the term smart city. We're already moving along. Why I like the term, as you saw in the uh, car, is smarter city. What do we want to visualize as the smarter city as we move along and, like you said, make smart decisions as we go? And the starting point. We're you at know, the starting the, point. Well, yeah, where, 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 is that? where are we on that starting point? Because we do have some advanced technology in the city, yes, we do. but where, where are we on that? And where we find the, I think, the need, and I can tell you we all said, when Susie said signals, we all looked at each other, like traffic signals, that's one of them. And I think also the other thing I want to state is that uh, moving around the city during the week, you know, driving around and driving around on the weekends, we now have traffic. We now, what I don't, I don't care what the people say on the outside of Goodyear, but we have density now, and they're out in their cars driving around. And I can see that can be a, a bone of contention with the different events we're having, like this weekend, and when you have several week, you know, events during the weekend. So anyway, thank you so much. I, mean, I thought it was good. Thank you. Everybody like that? Thank you. Yeah. I, thank you very, very be much. Back. So um, any other thing in the meeting tonight? Okay, then I'm going to adjourn this because we wanted to start right at 6 o'clock. Uh, because we have the, the learned people coming in. So this meeting is adjourned.